Hello, my gentle and of course very modern apes, and welcome to Vice Rhino's channel. My name is Gutsick Gibbon, and I thought today I would torture you a bit with a critique of the liminal horror that is Genesis Apologetics' series, Debunking Evolution in Public Schools. Taking place in a purgatorial white room, John and Jane are forced by a Lovecraftian cosmic deity to discuss evolution, trapped there until they get something, anything right. But John and Jane are cursed to say nothing correct, their mouths unable to form simple true sentences as they are damned to dwell in the existential dread of this white room for all eternity. That would be a much better, if a bit Kafka-esque video. Instead, this is a low-budget, aggressively unfunny short from Genesis Apologetics, the knockoff answers in Genesis. Now, I know what you're thinking. Gutsick Gibbon. Erica. My guy. Why would you ever think that a young Earth creationist organization would be capable of being right or funny? And the answer to that is... I don't know, I guess I'm just a little bit stupid. Let's get started. Is it just me, or does the evolutionary story keep changing? It's really great to know that after all these decades, creationists still don't know how science works. If a field changing when new information comes to light means that field is invalid, I guess genetics and medicine better take a hike. Aw oh yeah dude, epic intro. The part where there was a 3D guy that looked like he came out of Animal Planet's The Most Extreme really made me feel like the information we were about to receive was going to be correct and definitely well researched. Hmm. Hi John! Hey. John contemplates the horror of this liminal world where he has been trapped with Jane for an unknowable slice of eternity. He knows the knife will not kill her for he has tried before. He considers crying out to God, but his prayers fall on apathetic ears. Is this purgatory? Or perhaps hell? Hey, where'd this truck come from? Up in the attic. I was cleaning it out earlier and I found it and it's got a whole bunch of junk in here, but some of it is actually helping me with our science homework. Hey, hey, check this out. Oh man. Oh, was this your grandpa's old yearbook? Yeah, it must have been. Look how out of date everyone looks. Was this really in style back then? <laughs> Do you think our kids are gonna look at our yearbooks and say the same things? Category is... is... Pro-life eleganza. So, how'd you say this trunk helped you? Well, I'm starting to get the picture on human evolution. <laughs> Soak it in. This is the best the acting gets. This book was published in 1925 by Sir Arthur Keith, and now he was the president of the Royal Anthropological Society of Great Britain. And the skull? It was found in 1912. Now, it called Piltdown Man the find of the 20th century. So John and Jane have found Grandad's old trunk, which is inexplicably filled with human evolution stuff. Just go with it, this is an eldritch purgatory, it can have whatever it wants. But it wouldn't be a creationist video without reference to Piltdown Man, the famous fraudulent fossil from back in the 1940s. I bet their take on it is very reasonable. I think it was the New York Times said that it proves the theory of evolution. There were like 500 articles published when they first found this. Then in 1953, they discovered that the skull was a fake. Are you serious? Are you serious? Are you serious? Oh yeah. They took chemicals and they aged the skull. They made it look like it was really, really old. And then the jaw is actually from an orangutan. Just a quick note here. One of the best tells that someone shouldn't be talking about human evolution is calling an orangutan an orangutan. And the guy who discovered it, he actually filed the teeth down and made it look real. So Piltdown Man was a fraudulent hominin fossil pushed by one guy, an amateur archaeologist named Charles Dawson. And it should be noted that it was others within the paleoanthropological community and not creationists who called out this fraud. 
Since Piltdown Man, and I would propose perhaps because of it, the paleoanthropological community has become aggressively thorough when it comes to new hominins. In situ photos, or pictures of the specimen still in the ground, are essentially required. Laser scanning of articular surfaces allows researchers to determine whether bones came from the same individual, and dozens, if not hundreds, of people get to scrutinize a fossil before it goes to press. So, because of one fraud and a lot of embarrassment back in the 40s, the field of paleoanthropology and paleontology responded by applying intense new parameters to every subsequent fossil specimen to essentially vaccinate against any potential future fraud. In this way, Piltdown Man may have actually aided in the modern robusticity of the field. But I guess if a fraud in a field makes that field entirely a lie, we can throw out medicine, history, oh, and biblical antiquity too. You're under arrest, Nimrod. What the heck were scientists thinking? I changed my mind. This is actually the best the acting gets. Have you ever heard of Nebraska Man? Nebraska Man was the first American ape man fossil to be discovered, and Harold Cook found just a tooth. <laughs> Bet that made for us some news on museum display. Hey yo, what the? F There's no some news on museum display. Son, hold on. Nebraska Man is a funny one because almost no one in the paleoanthropological community accepted it as legit in the first place. So calling this thing a fraud would be like calling any fringe idea in any field an intentional fraud. There's such thing as a mistake or just being wrong. Also, this one was from the 1920s, so it's not like the identification of teeth was very far in its progression. Teosuid teeth do look surprisingly primate-like, given their diet is quite similar. Fortunately, we've come a long way since then. So no, it wasn't a fraud, just an amateur scientist getting ignored by all the legitimate scientists. Yeah, well, it was big enough for the New York Times, okay? And then it went viral for back then, and the London News did a whole drawing on it from a single tooth. There's still a picture of him on Wikipedia. They drew all that based on a tooth? Yeah, but ten years later they discovered out that that tooth was actually from an extinct pig. No way. Yeah. I gotta say, Jane is really giving it 100% where John is kind of phoning it in. I do like the idea, though, that if something is in the New York Times, it must be true. So, Piltdown Man was the popular proof for evolution for 40 years, and Nebraska Man was the popular proof for 10. Makes you wonder about what they're teaching us today. Yeah, Jane, you're right. Remember the time the Museum of the Bible pushed those fake Dead Sea Scrolls? I guess that means every Dead Sea Scroll is also fake, and we should throw out the Bible and all of its chronology. Period. I'm way ahead of you. Take a look at my little brother's sixth grade history book. Really? Your brother's book? You have way too much time on your hands. Mm. <laughs> this next section consists of John and Jane being mad that a sixth grade textbook is actually different from a high school textbook. While I don't have these textbooks on hand, my guess would be that they were not published in the same year and that the discrepancies come from the refining of dates and the addition of new fossil specimens that change the overall temporal range of a hominin. But maybe John and Jane are right, and there is an evil evolutionist cabal in some gothic castle somewhere plotting to swindle the youth into… something. They're not really clear on the motivations of the nefarious scientific community. Well, some of these eight men look familiar. <laughs> Long lost relatives of yours? No, I'm just kidding, but no, it's because they're in our book as well. Oh, well, in our book, they say Australopithecus afarensis evolved 3.8 to 3 million years ago. But in the sixth grade book, Australopithecus evolving 4 to 5 million years ago. Uh huh. Oh my god, I was actually wrong. It is much stupider and potentially more deceptive than I thought. Jane has just pointed out that Australopithecus afarensis has a range of 3.8 to 3 million years ago. She is upset and feels deceived because her textbook says that Australopithecus appeared in Africa 4 to 5 million years ago. But guys, 
they are conflating the range of a species, Australopithecus afarensis, and the emergence of an entire genus, Australopithecus as a whole. The oldest species within Australopithecus, Australopithecus anamensis, actually did appear in Africa between 4 and 5 million years ago. 4.2 tends to be the consensus today. And after this hominin, we see the emergence of Australopithecus afarensis 3.8 million years ago, showing that both textbooks are indeed correct. Feels a little sussy-wussy to me. Now, look at this. This is an old 1951 Life magazine publication. Well, why are we using a magazine publication from 1951? According to this, Australopithecus lived a million to 500,000 years ago. Oh, I see. Okay, it's because the dating methods in the 50s were much less refined, and they want to use this to bolster the idea that human evolution is inconsistent and thus should be thrown out. Naturally, paleoanthropology was doomed to be slain by a pop science magazine from the 50s using outdated methods. Okay, cool. Wow, that's different by a few million years. Mm -hmm. <sighs> These dates are all over the place. Yes, Jane, they are. It turns out you can't just conflate a genus emergence to a species emergence and then that to a magazine from the 50s. You might end up with some different dates. Yeah, well, it gets worse. So this is our biology, the Holt biology book. Okay. And it shows Homo habilis as living 1.6 to 1.9 million years ago. But in the sixth grade one, it's 2.4 million years ago. So which one's true? I guess it depends on which class you're in. How convenient that we didn't get to see where the sixth grade book says that. Do you think maybe it's actually discussing the origin of genus homo? Stop it. Get some help. So... What I'm wondering is if any of these dates are correct. It looks like today's truth is just tomorrow's fiction. Science can't change or it's wrong. Got it. If you look back at all the textbooks, they're all published at about the same time. This doesn't matter anymore because the issue is not understanding the difference between a genus and a species, John. Take a look at my little brother's sixth grade book. Now this book shows all of the popular fossils today. Okay, so here we are, Homo sapiens, right? right? But check out what came before us. Homo erectus. Right, and while he had a human body, evolutionists like to point out that he had a different skull, at least a modern human skull. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No. Homo erectus was unique from anatomically modern or even archaic Homo sapiens in many different ways in both the cranial and postcranial capacities. A recent paper notes that modern human body shape is a very recent evolutionary adaptation and that the rib cage of Homo erectus would have been significantly wider than our own. But these guys really want to focus on the skulls, so let's let them. That's where most of the problems lie anyway. Now, the journal Science, back in October of 2013, they reported they found skulls in Georgia, like Russia. It shows how different the Homo erectus skulls can look. Wow, they are so different. Ah, the Dimenisi skulls. We'll talk about these in a moment. Homo erectus and human skulls can be very similar. In fact, they did a study on 202 modern-day aborigines, like Australians, on the shape of their skulls, and they found that 14 of the 17 traits were the same on the aborigines as on the Homo erectus skulls. Oh, wow, really? Compared aboriginal people skulls to those of Homo erectus? I wonder when that was done. 1972, eh? So, it looks like Homo erectus wasn't becoming human, but was already human? Exactly. Ah, the old contested bones take. So can the argument be made that Homo erectus is the same as anatomically modern or even archaic Homo sapiens? No. Absolutely not. As previously mentioned, their postcrania is abjectly not the same as our own, and they would have been far less adapted for long distance running on the open savanna compared to Homo sapiens later on. But the big issue is actually with the skull. 
Homo sapiens, archaic and modern, have a brain case size of around 1200 cc's, or cubic centimeters. A chimpanzee, for example, is around 350 cc's. Australopithecines max out at around 550 cc's. Homo erectus is highly variable, but those Demonisi skulls they showed? They have brain cases ranging from 546 to 775 cc's. I would say that this is just a little bit off from being already human or completely human. In fact, a review of these skulls from 2017 found them to share many characteristics with both Homo erectus and the much earlier hominin, Homo habilis, and that the Demonisi specimens may represent a continuum of forms, a transitional species between the two. This has given cause for some paleoanthropologists to consider the Demonisi specimens a member of an entirely different species from Homo erectus, dubbed Homo georgicus. But excluding the Dimonisi specimens, we still get an average brain case size for Homo erectus of 900 cc's, significantly smaller than that of modern humans. So no, in any situation, in any case, with any morphology considered, these hominins were not fully human or already human. They were something in between anatomically modern Homo sapiens and the much earlier Australopithecines. The next ape man back is Homo habilis. Homo means human. So they're trying to make him look more human-like than he really is. They don't have to. Homo habilis sported a brain case larger than the preceding Australopithecines and had a more orthognathic or flat face. The designation in Homo is based on morphology, an entire suite of it, not a hatred of creationists. So Richard Leakey is a famous evolutionist and he said of the several dozen specimens that have been said at one time or another to belong to Homo habilis, at least half of them don't. But there is no consensus as to which 50% should be excluded. No one anthropologist 50% is quite the same as another's. So they can't even really classify which fossils are supposed to go into which category. In fact, some scientists are fighting to have Homo habilis reclassified as Australopithecus. What creationists don't understand is that when scientists say that Homo habilis may consist of two or more species, they're not saying that Homo habilis and the finds that designate it are invalid specimens or that this is an invalid species. They're merely suggesting that the variability within Homo habilis may designate or warrant the designation of another species within it. But also, this is a fairly outdated idea as showcased by the fact that this quote from Leakey is from 1992. I am currently a PhD student in biological anthropology and know of no current biological anthropologists who think that Homo habilis, quote, isn't a valid taxon, unquote. The idea that Homo habilis should be within Australopithecus and not genus Homo is another idea that is fairly well out of vogue. Which one? Australopithecus is Lucy. Oh yeah, I've heard of her. Yeah. She's an icon, she's a legend, and she is the moment. Arnold Johansson, 1973, discovered just the shin and the leg bone. Now, the way they line up makes scientists think that she could walk upright. Mm-hmm. There's a picture of her. Wow, there's a lot of her missing. <laughs> hey, at least it's more than a tooth. <laughs> it's true. You want to see the fragments of the skull that they found? Sure. Whoa, 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 wait, hold on. Aren't we going to talk about her knee? You know, one of the reasons we know that this species was a biped when on the ground? Jane, John, you can't just skip it if you're supposed to be debunking human evolution here. So how exactly do we know that Lucy, or Australopithecus afarensis, was a biped like humans and most other hominins? Lucy's remains, as well as the remains of over 300 other Australopithecus individuals, display four traits that biomechanically diagnose this genus as bipedal when on the ground. The first is the valgus knee, what John just discussed there. Lucy's knee is essentially indistinguishable from our own, angling inward so as to bear the weight directly below the body. This is a valgus condition and is in stark contrast to the knees of knuckle-walking apes. The second is her bull-shaped pelvis with sagittally oriented iliac blades. Her pelvis looked like our own, shaped to strengthen the pelvic floor and anchor powerful glutes that allow us to stay upright while still or while moving. The third is her foot morphology, which displays three arches and an inline helix or big toe like other hominin bipeds, including ourselves. 
Chimpanzees, for contrast, have an abducted hallux and no arches. The fourth and last is perhaps best represented in other Australopithecus remains and skulls, and this is the anterior foramen magnum, or hole, at the base of the skull. This allows bipeds to hold their head upright while walking, and in knuckle-walking apes or other quadrupeds, this hole is much more posterior towards the back of the skull. This entire suite of traits, which of course Lucy has all of, necessitates bipedality, and organisms that have them cannot biomechanically be quadrupedal. So yes, Australopithecus is indeed a bipedal genus, just like us, full stop. All right, wait for it. Booyah. Wow. That's what they found. Not that much. Creationists almost never mention other Australopithecine specimens outside of Lucy. Remember, we have remains from hundreds of individuals, and Lucy, as well as her species, Australopithecus afarensis, is not the only one within the genus. Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus gauri, and Australopithecus sediba are also incredibly well represented, better than Lucy in some cases, which is probably why they aren't ever mentioned. But seriously, next time a creationist brings up Lucy, ask them if they know of any other Australopithecus specimens or remains. Man, there's a lot of skulls in here. Was your grandpa a witch doctor? No, he was a yard sailor. Now, looky what we have here. We have here a modern bonobo monkey skull. Bonobo monkey? Bonobos are close relatives to chimpanzees, so while the law of monophyly states that they are technically still catarine monkeys just like we are, we all know that John here just doesn't know the colloquial difference between a monkey and an ape. This is something, to be clear, that YouTuber video game Donkey can even get right. You are a bonobo ape. And we have Lucy. So the brown pieces are the actual fragments of Lucy's skull that they found. So two things on the fragments comment. One, again, we have numerous more complete Australopithecus skulls when compared to Lucy, both within her species of Australopithecus afarensis and in other closely related species. But two, mammals are bilaterally symmetric. This means if you have the left side piece, you can mirror it to the right. This means we need far less of a skull, and of a body in general, to get a good idea of what an animal looked like both cranially and postcranially. They look so alike. Her brain is only a third the size of a modern human's, about the average chimp brain size, and she only stood about three and a half feet tall. The specimen known as Lucy does have a chimpish brain of around 375 to 400 cc's. This is a bit larger than a modern chimp, but she was also a very small individual. She's on like the smallest end of the range for variation of body size and brain case size within all of the Australopithecus specimens we have. Other Australopithecines, including members of her own species, had brain cases of perhaps up to 550 cc's. So the variation both within the species and across species is clearly not being considered here. I don't know why I expected that it would be. Take a look at the way that Lucy has been portrayed in like the media, like books and films, online. Wow. Everywhere. They really went out of their way to make her look human-like. Take a look in our other biology book. Oh, wow. Hey, look at the whites of those eyes. You know, I've been to a lot of different zoos, and I've seen a lot of different apes, and each of them have completely brown eyes, and not the eye whites that us humans have. I don't know how this one even got started in the Young Earth Creationist camps, because it is so easily proven to be outright false, many other apes have white sclera. It's thought to be beneficial because it allows conspecifics or other group members to follow your gaze. This isn't that complicated and takes a simple Google search, and I very much doubt that Jane has been to that many zoos. Man, it even looks like she's thinking about something. Yeah, bananas. <laughs> I don't think they found any eyeball fossils, but 
If you wanted to make an ape man look more human, changing the colors of the eye whites in pictures is a good way to do it. That's true. Here's a picture of what she probably looked like. Man, what a difference. For those of you out there playing the Genesis Apologetics drinking game, you can drink for any time they crib from answers in Genesis. This representation of Lucy comes from the Creation Museum, which does not deign to discuss why Australopithecus afarensis is considered to be a biped. Those characteristics we discussed earlier, not a word about them in the museum. And I know I was there. Yeah, well, they do say they have found several complete skeletons of the Australopithecus, though not specifically Lucy. They found around 360, 362 actual specimens from the species Australopithecus, specifically Lucy. It's actually just the opposite of what he said, right? Australopithecus is the genus, Australopithecus afarensis is the species, and Lucy is the specimen, right? So no, all of those different individuals and the remains that are associated with them are not specifically Lucy. They are the farthest possible thing within the terminology of being specifically Lucy. But I mean, this just goes to show how unfamiliar these guys are with the terminology. Charles Oxnard said, the Australopithecines known over the last several decades are now irrevocably removed from a place in the evolution of human bipedalism. All this should make us wonder about the usual presentation of human evolution in introductory textbooks. So they never go back to discussing how many specimens we have of the genus. This whole thing has been debunking human evolution and they're like, let's talk about two hominins, maybe three, and also Lucy the specimen. It is a total hit and run. As for the Oxnard quote, it comes from 1983, only the freshest and latest for John and Jane. To be clear, the lion's share of hominin fossil material has been from the last 20 to 30 years. So 1983, problematic. Well, now you understand why I've been digging through this chest. I mean, really, the way it looks is that Lucy's just an extinct ape. I'm kind of feeling angry. Like I've been duped. Oh, you have, Jane. Just not in the way you might think. Uh, same thing with Neanderthals. Check out these illustrations that came out after they started finding Neanderthal fossils. Check this one out. This was published in the Illustrated London News about 100 years ago. Whoa. Okay, that's pretty brutish. Now, do you want to know what they think he looks like now? Sure. Uh, <laughs> wow! Just recently, scientists have discovered that Neanderthals buried their dead, they worked with tools, they wore makeup, they controlled fire, and they even found in a cave in Israel that Neanderthals and humans were living together and building families together. And in other places as well. Okay, well, okay, you know what? That settles it. That settles it. If they can live together, and if they have children together, then Neanderthals are just humans, but the difference is, is that their appearance varies. So this is wrong for a lot of reasons. Neanderthals appear much earlier in the fossil record than Homo sapiens does. They have morphological characteristics that are entirely unique to them, and we've sequenced their genome, and it places them outside of the human, or Homo sapiens, range. For context, the average human is 99.9% .9 similar genomically to another human. Neanderthals are 99.7% similar to any different humans when we're comparing their genomes side by side. This seems like a lot, but you have to remember that chimpanzees, anatomically modern chimpanzees, are 98.8% similar to the average human when we compare the genomes side by side. So there's less than 1% difference in comparison of human relationships to Neanderthals and human relationships to chimpanzees when it comes to how closely related we are to either species. Now, while the genetic similarities and differences between Neanderthals do necessitate them being different species, they absolutely could genetically interbreed. So interbreeding absolutely did occur, but the ability to interbreed does not mean that the two organisms are the same species. Polar bears and grizzly bears can produce viable offspring, as can Chinese and American paddlefish. Species, we have to remember, is an arbitrary concept that was invented by humans to help us categorize life. But if we're being consistent genetically, 
morphologically, and of course, looking at the geochronology. Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis are indeed unique species. This does mean that they are not quote-unquote fully human or anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Just like different people groups today can vary. So either these fossils are completely human or completely ape with nothing in between. Oh? John or Jane, would you like to draw the line for me here of which of these skulls are fully human and which ones are fully ape? Maybe you'll, at long last, give us a unique answer, since no creationist has ever agreed on which are which. The gradient is simply too smooth. But this is of course why John and Jane and Genesis Apologetics simply ignores most of the hominins on this list. Now, a specimen is basically any piece of bone, including teeth, that they find. All the specimens from all the different ape men that they've actually found, okay. you can fit them in the back of a small pickup truck. Are you serious? Dead serious. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. I'm not sure where this pickup truck thing came from, but given we have thousands of individual remains from hundreds of different individuals from dozens of different hominins, I'm inclined to press X to doubt. Now, if our textbooks won't address the new evidence, what does the Bible say? Man was created on the sixth day, in God's image, out of dirt, and God breathed life into him. And 1 Corinthians 15.39 says, All flesh is not the same kind of flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of man, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. Wait, so to God, humans, fish, and birds are all not animals. That's very weird. But it's also very weird that to John and Jane, it's more noble to be descended from a pile of dirt than it is from an ape. That sums it up pretty nicely. Yep. So, what'd you think of Grandpa's chest? I thought it was amazing. Me too. And we learned that just like a style can go out of fashion, the popular ape men theories and their fossils do the same thing. And while their theory keeps changing, God's word never does. How nauseatingly infantile to think that a field of thought changing its position as new information comes to light is a weakness. The mutability of science is its greatest strength. It urges us to discover more, learn more, seek more, so that we can incorporate new knowledge and increase our understanding of this wild world we find ourselves in. Kind of makes you think, doesn't it? And so, John and Jane have cycled yet again through a series of falsities, their minds screaming, pleading to say but one correct sentence. Imprisoned in this liminal world, they know soon the cycle will begin again, as it has before, and will continue to do. What will they be forced to lie about next? The age of the Earth? Natural selection? Only their indifferent cosmic captor knows. But John and Jane will never escape this eternal, never-ending nightmare, so saith their lord, Dan Biddle of Genesis Apologetics. So, big thanks to Vice Rhino for having me on. I've been your gentle and modern guest host, Gutsick Gibbon, and I hope this has been fun for you. Through it all, I really feel only one emotion, though. Hey.